Welcome to Martial Wisdom. Here you can listen to conversations on all kinds of topics related to martial arts. Today's topic is Kenji Tamiki and Shotokan Aikido. Joining me in this conversation is Al Blanco. Before we get started, please consider supporting this podcast by liking and sharing it. I'm also thrilled to announce that our Spirit Aikido online program now has over 215 videos. In some of the more recent videos, I cover defenses for headlocks and guillotines and ways to work these into your live training with Aikido. Another option is to contribute any amount you like through the PayPal tip jar. Even small contributions are greatly appreciated. I have one small correction before we get started. Within the conversation, we talk about Muay Thai. I misspoke and said the Philippines when I meant to say Thailand. It is Thailand, not the Philippines, that is the birthplace of Muay Thai. I hope you enjoy this episode. Now, on with the discussion. I want to welcome Al Blanco. Uh, We're going to talk about Tamiki Aikido and Shotokan today. Uh, He is a moderator of the Tamiki subreddit. Uh, So he was recommended to me as somebody to talk to and get a little bit more uh, in-depth understanding of Kenji Tomiki, his influence on Aikido, and, uh, and of Shotokan Aikido. So uh, welcome, Al, to the podcast. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I've said this before, but I'm a fan of your show, and it's uh, really it's nice to be on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, Kenji Tomiki is a name that I'd heard uh, not long after starting Aikido, uh, my Aikido training, um, back when I did. And I've, the more I learned of him, which granted wasn't a great deal, it seemed like there was a bit of a separation with, uh, with his pursuit of, of Aikido and kind of the, the Aikikai in the mainstream, you call it that. Um, yeah. But I was fascinated in that he had a background that brought him from judo. He was a very high ranked judo practitioner into Aikido. Perhaps yeah. you could describe a little bit of, of his background and, and how he came into uh, to cross paths with Morahai and, and what what brought mm-hmm. him into the Aikido world. So, I, well, a little bit going a little further back. Okay, so he was born in 1900, and I think that is important because that was really like the tail end of the Meiji era. And he had that same character of a lot of the teachers we know. Mm-hmm. But they had sort of one foot in the past, you know, and one foot in you know, the Judah era, the modern era, the, the sporting era. Mm-hmm. And so I think that explains that alone explains a lot of his love for both having what he called, you know, his two great teachers, right? Kano mm-hmm. and Oishiba. So he was already a fifth dan in judo when he was introduced, fifth or fourth, uh, when he was introduced to Oishiba. And only two years later, he started studying. And I guess he must have fallen in love with it because he ended up being one of Oishiba's higher ranking students very quickly mm-hmm. and was, in fact, the first to ever be awarded a Menkyo. Kaiden, I mean, you Kaiden, and then, which was later during the foundation of the Dainipon Budokai, all the Menkyo Kaidens were transferred into eighth dan. So he's technically Oishiba's first eighth dan student. Hmm. So he really, from his writing, I gather what his appeal, what he found appealing was that A, this preserved a lot that was left out of Judo from hmm. Koryu Jiu Jitsu. So and this, and this was also, it was his, uh, it was actually Kano's original goal to eventually incorporate all of Koryo Jiu Jitsu under a sporting context. Mm-hmm. And we have some, some histor, histor, historical conversations between Kano and Tamiki, where he specifically tasked Tamiki to try to bring these elements in. And it was the long term goal to mm-hmm. make Jiu Jitsu, uh, Judo not just competitive Nagewaza. And Katame Waza, but Kensetsu Waza and Atemi Waza, basically mm. four realms that he documented. And, um, you know, what, what did Tamiki do? He was first and foremost an educator, right? So his first job after the war was professor at Waseda University. And so he was a, basically a phys ed teacher. And then he ended up being chair of the phys ed department at Waseda University. Um, he is the architect of Goshen Jitsu which is one of the final katas you learn in judo, hmm. the primary architect. It was actually technically it was a 25-person committee, but he is, uh, it has been largely recognized, including by the Kano son in the opening of the pamphlet that was published upon the uh, release of Koshin Jitsu Kata, that he was the primary architect. Hmm. And 
That also led to the his work with military self-defense training. So he was a co-architect of the Japan's military self-defense training and also the police self-defense training. So he had his hand, he apparently was on the committee that was responsible for the Taiko Jitsu. So, and you'll see, you'll see elements of Goshen Jitsu and, you know, when you see elements of Goshen Jitsu in the military style, in the, I forget the name of it, and Taiko Jitsu, you'll see, it's because he had his hands in that. And so he was just a really very accomplished martial artist of his day. Uh, he was also on the um, the, pre the successor to the Dai Nippon Budokai, which was the Nippon Budogaki, which was the National Organization of Martial Arts. So this guy was like, he was very much involved. It was his, he was a big name at one point, and it was kind of my intention to make sure that he's not forgotten, you know, mm -hmm. outside of this small Tamiki Shotokan Aikido world. Yeah, that's, that's really what I wanted this to be for, that's why I named it. Sure. You know, one of the things, one of the first things I learned uh, about him, and granted, I, I don't know a great deal of, of about Tamiki, but that, that struck me, the thing that struck me as a profound thing is the fact that he was a professional teacher. And, yeah. and in, in, in that, and as I understand, uh, Jigoro Kano was too, and, and it's <laughs> evident that their experience in organizing the curriculum and organizing teaching yeah. had, did have a profound effect. And, I, and I've run into many different, very skilled martial artists who are not very good or very organized teachers. They may even be able to teach concepts very well, but yes. when it comes to organizing how to do it in a way that makes sense, you know, over a period of time with students, you know, over an extended period, <clears throat> um, that's another skill set alone. And, and I've, yeah. I, I do find a great respect for those people that bring that organization, organizational ability to being able to uh, create a student experience that is cohesive and makes sense over time. Yeah. Um, and the, the other thing that I was told that uh, Tomiki was, a, was one of the main architects, if not the main designer of what the, the Randori practice that, that mm -hmm. I learned at my dojo and that was, and I know mm -hmm. there's many Randori types of Randori practice, but it's generally yeah. the multiple attackers are coming after a, a single Nage repeatedly and you that's it's an exercise but it's a pretty good live exercise um type of a i don't want to say drill but you know it's it has the flavor of competition in mm -hmm. fact we're going to get into that topic of competition you know as we is a little bit later but uh sure. but it has that flavor of live um yeah. exercise that i really like and i it sounds like tamiki was took li live exercise and and very important uh, is a very important thing as part of the training cycle yeah, uh, he, he wrote extensively about that. And mm -hmm. I mean, thank goodness he was such a prolific writer. We have a lot of, a lot of his stuff was translated. So, you know, we've, we've been very fortunate that mm -hmm. we have a lot to draw from, but you know, he hits that point a lot. Mm -hmm. Not to the exclusion of Kata. He, he found, mm -hmm. he felt that Kata was also important. Um, so yeah, but he was definitely following in the footsteps you might say of kano and trying to do the same for aikido what he had done for you know and it strikes me that that today uh aikido practitioners we seem to be at at a place uh, many of us are where we are taking on the same approach that tamiki did at least with intent to combine yeah. the the precision of the kata because you know every sport fighter drills uh movement they drill the boring yeah. stuff you know they, yeah. they go through the movement practice and mm -hmm. then they combine that with with other exercises and drills of more of a live nature you know maybe yeah. a limited sparring or or you know pad work things that that start to bring in that adaptive part and then they go into more of a freestyle form um, yeah. which would be like a full sparring or or rolling or, or what have you but there's a spectrum there and i and i think that uh, this is why I was excited to talk about Tamiki because it sounded like he had this in his, his intention from, mm -hmm. from very early on. Um, yeah. and, and maybe that's something that can help, you know, the modern Aikido, you know, practitioners and instructors take a look at, you know, are we, have we limited our, our training too much to Kata and not enough to other types of live, live yeah. practice. And, and that seems to me, and, and I'm very, you know, I've seen this trend, you know, there's a lot of videos and I don't, 
I don't know all their names, but I've seen a lot of videos lately, a lot of people trying to sort of functionalize Aikido, get the martial side of Aikido. Mm -hmm. and, and I just think that like, yeah, competition's a good way to do that, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and it's, what's nice is that it's done, it's sort of baked, you know? And, and mm -hmm. they've dealt with the finding the balance. It's not a simple matter to come up with a competitive system for these particular techniques, which are, well, let's just say that there's a particularly high uh, danger element, right? So you, you can get hurt easy with this, especially at speed. And this, so there was a reason why we, you know, it was done as a kata originally, and I understand that. And it took somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 years to engineer this system. And it strikes, you know, a few compromises are made, of course, in the interest of developing instinct, strategy, timing. Um, personally, I feel it's a good trade-off. It's a, you know, positive trade-off. Sure. And, so, uh, and know, I think I'll, that, I'll that you, yeah. yeah, you hit on a on a concept there that I think is really important, and that is, you know, because I've I've heard many people argue about, well, we it's you have to go full speed, full contact to get any benefit, and that. <laughs> it seems like and if you can't then you're not really training and and i think that the idea here is that the perfect should not be the enemy of the good in that if you go 100 percent speed 100 percent contact you know mm -hmm. full contact you're you're going to get people banged up like that's yeah. just how it goes and you know i i had a, a mentor years ago that told me of uh, he, he has a background in muay thai and he said that you know Americans typically will show up in in the Philippines and they'll they'll get all jazzed up about you know going to the mecca of Muay Thai and they show up and they want to train and maybe they've done some Muay Thai training in the states but they want to go to where it's real they get real Muay Thai training in the Philippines yeah. and they show up and they want to just fight they want to fight go 100% speed and yeah. intensity and they don't realize that the natives they don't train like that because you can't train like your body cannot train like that constantly yeah, yeah. or you, you just be so banged up i mean they may do a real fight once twice a year you know maybe, maybe three times but the rest of the time they're doing you know consistent moderate intensity to low intensity training working on the movements basically the equivalent to what we would call kata mm -hmm. forming the movement that's not beating you know pounding your body because that is a very hard and pounding style yeah. um you know and i think that uh, you know, Aikido throwing people onto the ground is also very hard. I mean, judoka understand this, yeah. uh, you know, you don't get judo practice looking like an Olympic match. You just yeah. can't train like that all the time. Um, and so, you know, I suppose when you're younger, you can take a lot more damage than when you're older, but the principle is still the same, you know, and now we get into modern sport martial artists who, mm -hmm. Uh, coaching has gotten to a level of technology and advancement where they realize how much value there is in that, you know, 40%, 30 to 40% uh, live training, but just training at a low intensity because you can do it for a lot longer and you're not restricted by the injuries that you take up. Um, so I think that you're right. There's always that trade off of, yeah. you know, the intensity part. And if anything, for those people that, that say, well, if you're not going hundred percent, then you're not going like, I think that's an inaccurate yeah. assessment. It's, uh, it's there's fair. a lot of learning that happens when you can slow yeah. down a bit so you can see what's happening. Yeah. Um, but you know, you'll never get a boxer that all he's done is full speed yeah. matches to learn how to box. Like, and, and even the boxer hard. doesn't have to worry about being, you know, doesn't have to worry about a double leg takedown. Doesn't have to worry about, you know, so there's other things that are sure. not happening that boxer so he can isolate and think about yep. what it takes to be a boxer. Exactly. And, and, and removing the fear is part of it. And, you know, I know with, with Aikido, one of the big fears is as students come in and start learning is whether or not they're going to hit their ukemi correctly and not get hurt by being thrown. So yes. it takes a while to, to build the ukemi skills to, for them to remove that fear and build their confidence in their ability to, you know, not be hurt by the ground. Um, but I think that that's something I've found even with newer students who are, who start getting used to it, they do really like the live play. I think the, the live work, uh, things that we would call G that we call Giawazas or randoris are not, uh, something that needs to have, you know, students be brown belts before they can start learning to train it. 
that way. I think it happens very early and it sounds like Shotokan has got that built into the curriculum yeah. uh, early on. Is that correct? Yeah. And I would say that like, um, there was effort, there were efforts that were towards the tail end of its development, you know, in the forties and then extending on, I think right up through the sixties to reincorporate what we would say is contemporary Aikido. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that as you get your first, second, third dance, you start to learn what, they, what we call the Koryu Kanas, mm -hmm. the old Kanas, the old forms. And so, um, you know, it's, it's an attempt to keep it as integrated as possible. So we start with those, you know, the sporting aspect, but we're trying to also learn the fuller kata complement. And sure. in theory, it's all there. Although mm -hmm. apparently one of them was uh, never finished. The last one was never finished after the second director passed away. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the questions I had was, and I've noticed this with many different practitioners, they tend to have their favorite techniques or their favorite oh. approaches. Like they're, you, you can you spot are. somebody and how they do something. And, yeah. and this goes back to a story. I remember I went to, I visited a seminar years ago and we were doing uh, a Sankyo. And, mm -hmm. and I would get my UK into a Sankyo and sort of get my center under him lift and then cut. And I had a, a guy come over. I'd never seen him before. He kind of came out of nowhere and he walks over. He says, you're one of Bill Sosa's students, aren't you? Yeah. And I said, well, not directly, but I'm, he's in my lineage. He says, I've, I recognize because he loved doing that. Like every time he would get a Sankyo, that's how he would finish it. As opposed to stepping around the arm, and stepping out and dropping UK down. Yeah. Um, it was just a really cool, uh, connection with somebody who unfortunately i never got to meet him he passed away uh not long after i started uh, training and he lived across the country but i'm curious of what kenji tamiki had as some of the the favorites approaches that that he liked and did and were they strong enough for him that he integrated them into the curriculum i've heard that that uh, Sho, uh shomenate is one of the the first uh yes. techniques of of Shotokan, is that right? It's the first, yes. Sure. And, and I um, love that technique too. I mean, once I learned that and got kind of got comfortable with it, I, it just bubbled right to the top of my some of my favorite applications. Between, between that, you know, the first, second, third, which are basically from different angles, but it's the same thing: a palm strike from the center, from outside, and from right, from from the right, from the left, from from the outside, mm -hmm. and from under. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I do. I will tell you this, this little anecdote. So my instructor, who was a student of Tamiki, mm -hmm. would tell us um, what his what Tamiki would say to them when they were doing randori was, Atemi, Atemi, Atemi. If he didn't see enough strikes or people trying to sort of grab, get grabby and try to wrestle and say, no, 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 strike, strike, strike. You know, so it was really, it seems, you know, from that I gathered that he really saw it as a striking art mm -hmm. where then the joint locks would come in as someone tried to grab you or you were able to set up a wrist catch, a wrist grab or something like that. Sure. And definitely, Atemi was, is supposed to be central. It's, it's your go-to, it's when in doubt Atemi, you know. <laughs> yeah, and that, you know, the times we've heard Aikido is 99% Atemi or 95% or 90% or, or 70, or whatever the percentage is, it's, it's a clear majority. And I know that that yeah. statement claims to have come from Morihai himself. Uh, Gozo Shioda, I guess, said that, well, since I said that, uh, mm -hmm. the numbers shift a little bit, but I, I, I agree with you. And I think in, in breaking that down, if you take any hand-to-hand -hand combat and eliminate striking, you now have pure grappling only. And that can work if you have, if that's the understood engagement, but mm -hmm. um, for any real self-defense you have to consider a slap or a strike or or that has to be on the table not just for what to how to defend yourself but how to initiate a motion to to bridge the gap into yeah. a grappling range um and if an art doesn't have that it's got a big hole in it um yeah. well I, that that kind of goes to what tamiki was trying to do originally right mm -hmm. Originally, he had his students, and again, he wrote a little bit about this. He touched on the subject that his students didn't have basically any idea what to do in the striking range, and they would just sort of. And as you know, judo competitions start, and you go height, and you come up, and you grab, and you go to uh, you start grappling, and they pretend as they're approaching, they have to assume the punches don't exist. Mm -hmm. And so, what he wanted to do was add um, 
a response and a facility in the striking range, which includes joint attacks, by the way. And, you know, so a lot of people think striking range means striking, not necessarily. It's just things to do at a distance. And in fact, one of the early names was Hanare Judo, mm -hmm. which means distance judo or separated judo. Okay. And that's all it was. And then it expanded and expanded and it kind of became its own thing. And he would differentiate Hanare Judo from what he called regular judo, it was Kumi Judo, it was grappling judo. Mm. So he had two separate judos in, in the greater, what he would call greater judo. And he wanted to make it all judo, essentially. And um, then, of course, it started to get built up more, the curriculum got built up, and it became its own style. But originally, it was just like graduate judo. Sure. You know, yeah. you know that brings up a question that I've, I've, I've wondered about since in speculating how Morhai taught and even how his, his instructors taught seemed to me that he had so many students coming to him that were already high level judoka that yes. there was really no judo crossover stuff material taught to aikido practitioners yeah. with yeah. the assumption they already know this stuff why would we do it at least yeah. that's the the general i guess uh theory does did tomiki include uh judo techniques for students that were not previously judo practitioners is that part of the curriculum no th th there's a few there are a few crossover, there are a few very similar techniques. Right? Mm -hmm. So we have something called Hikiotosh, which is very similar to Ukiotosh. Okay. And but the grip is different, right? Again, it's from a distance. Mm -hmm. Um we have a sumiotosh and they have a sumiotosh, except instead of lapel sleeve, it's wrist arm, right? Wrist and forearm. But and it's the mechanics are similar. But that's about it. And I do believe there was an intentional effort to not overlap. Hmm. Because, like you said, it's already, and he was a judo guy, and his students were historically would also train judo. And this was really intended as a cross training, mm. um, a cross training art, which I have no problem with. I actually think it's preferable to a style that tries to do everything. Sure. You yeah. know, and that, and that may be a testament of the age where the mm -hmm. separation of arts made sense and it, or it fit mm -hmm. people's expectation at the time. Uh, yeah. you know, I'm looking at what our times are like now, where a prospective student uh, may not care for the a la carte approach of, well, I've got to go train this thing to learn this, and I got to go train that mm -hmm. thing to learn that. Whereas, you know, I, I personally, I, there's a number of hip throws that judo does that are so fantastic and simple and direct and powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I can't not to work them and, and share them. Of course, giving credit where they're due. I mean, judo's hip throws are, I don't think there's another art that does hip throws as well as, as judo yeah. does. Like that is their bread and butter. Um, I mean, I guess there's, there's a fun, there is a sort of logistical problem with studying multiple arts. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, that was clearly, I think, the expectation. And it's nothing new. I think the, at the time when this was being formulated, the expectation was certainly that, yeah, you would spend a, a, year, a year here or two years there and kind of bounce around. Um, I still believe that you should go to that, the relative experts. You know, you have a couple sure. of styles that are, that try to do every range, right? Even in the traditional world, where you have Hapkido and Kudo and Kajuken, well, Kajukenbo isn't that traditional, it's about 50 years old or 40 years old. Um, and um, you even have a number of styles that are 100% judo and tamiki aikido merged and rebranded right there's nihon jitsu there's yarawa or fuko judo which is just tamiki um i think there's one other i personally like to say i like to go to the specialists sure. you know if you want to learn how to throw you're going to do wrestling you're going to do judo mm -hmm. uh, you want to learn how to box i mean look boxing is what 250 years old Two, yeah. in its modern form 150 They've never had to worry about anything else. No one's trying. They got to sit there and work on eight punches, mm -hmm. you know, their whole career. And, you know, that doesn't just help you in terms of having, well, I want to get to that separately, but as a community, it helps us. Mm -hmm. And so let's say I do want to be a generalist. Well, it's, I'm a generalist, but with the benefit of someone who just did one of those ranges and can really teach me the finer points. And so, you know, as a community, it's good that we have these different places to go sure. for that. And, you know, no one kicks better than, you know, the certain Okinawan karate schools. And of course, Muay Thai, very popular for a kick. I mean, mm -hmm. 
I've never seen anything you know like that elsewhere. And no one throws like judo. No one does kensetsu waza like to make aikido and aikido. No. Right? This is what we do, and this is our range. Sure. You know? Yeah, and it, it really applies where you want to take that art, whether you, know, you want to get into a certain competition. Of course, you're, a generalist is not going to go into a particular sport realm and, and do yeah. well unless they, they really hone in on what that sport is focused on. And I think, yeah. you know, this is something that's occurred to me a long time ago, which is, you know, if you are looking for from a self-defense standpoint, uh, you'd have no idea what you're going to be facing. And yeah. the, the best thing that you can do is have a bit of experience to spot what you are dealing with and be the thing that 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 person can't deal with very well. For example, you see somebody that looks like they've they've done some boxing and they bring their hands up and you <laughs> you tag them and take them down. You know, so you take them out of their realm. And and I think this was something that was established back in the 80s with the UFCs is how many good martial artists, once you dump them on their back are helpless or yeah. pretty close to helpless. And yeah. this is why I think um, the grappling is, is good to know, not only to yeah. have, have the, that thing that could be very useful, but also to be comfortable enough on the ground, which is uh, to, in order to, so that you are not being the one taken like a fish out of water. Yeah, if You get taken down, you don't feel helpless. Um, yeah. and, and I think that, you know, the, this is like Tamiki, he seemed to have his head on all right, what do I want to do? What, what do I want this art to be? And it seems like he was pretty rigorous with uh, bringing in innovations. And, mm -hmm. and I like, I like that. And the, the innovations he brought in certainly seemed to be affected by his time. And it, and they had tangible goals with his, I assume, you know, teaching police and law enforcement, military, yeah. you know, those are very tangible goals of what, what does this art need to be able to do? Um, you know, and I think there's some modern, uh, practitioners that are trying to do some similar things with, uh, restraint, uh, law enforcement, restraint yeah. curriculums and things like that. And I definitely see this could be applicable and I, I, I believe this is still very applicable to modern times, this particular Absolutely. subset of techniques. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in many respects, I think, uh, Aikido and, and, this is where I guess jujitsu has got means a lot of things to a lot of people, but the traditional standing jujitsu that uh, was that birthed the, the modern or contemporary jujitsu, which is more you know competitive on the ground and whatnot. But that has tremendous uh, application to civilian martial art use, whether it's self protection or police uh, uh, apprehension and restraint, uh, even people in the medical field, you know, orderlies at hospitals that have unruly patients that are, you know, maybe suffering from a seizure or from, you know, delusion where they have to be restrained, but in a way that does not harm them. Like yeah. that to me is the, some of the best parallel for, for how Aikido and, and that standing jujitsu uh, parallels. Yeah. Um, uh, well, as far as like you, what you started talking about was the, Cross training, you know, mm -hmm. specifically ground fighting. Sure. It kind of goes into the idea of whether or not you should cross train. A, I believe you should. Uh, Tamiki never said Tamiki Aikido was, or Shotokan Aikido was a complete style. Mm -hmm. It wasn't intended to be. And I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm very much okay with that. In fact, I think it's optimal. I have cross trained, you know, a lot. I, I, I currently do judo as well. I, I wrestled in high school, I did Muay Thai for a while, did all those things. I love this range. I love this style. This to me is fascinating. And, mm -hmm. and again, and as I said, I think Tamiki himself was an underappreciated teacher, so sort of sure. led to this effort. Um, but working on the ground, you say, okay, I want to be a striker, or at least I want to be in the striking range. That's where I'm comfortable. That's my, maybe I have long limbs or something like that. It's conducive. Do you have to be you know, brown belt BJJ or, you know, you know, collegiate wrestler to survive, right? There's a difference. Do you want to be even in all the ranges? Do you have the time to do that? Or do you want to learn just enough to survive and get back to your feet? Mm -hmm. Like just to be just not a, not an easy mark, you know, keep your feet. Um, the way to do that is to, you know, do spend some time in judo so that you're not just this, well, 
you know, you, you can't just be swept at will, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, ideally, according to my teacher, which is a, a admittedly more Kano aligned, and, and a, as a small aside, you'll find that there are different flavors of Shotokan Aikido schools mm -hmm. that, are, course, that yeah. are either sort of more Weishiba or Kano aligned. Mm -hmm. I'm from a more Kano aligned school, and our goal is brown belt in one, black in the other. You're supposed to have at least that. Mm -hmm. um, but even the, you, even if you didn't have brown belt, you're, by the time you're a green belt in judo, you're already not so easy to throw. You can survive. Even a black belt's you know, attempts at throwing you, you can survive the first three or four. And that's all it takes. Because what a black belt in judo is really, really poor at dealing with is shomenate, which you talked about. You had shomenate, just shomenate. And this is actually how I start teaching sometimes when the, when, when the judo guys who are sort of primarily judo come to the Aikido class, the first thing I do is start this. I, I, just do that. Do all your judo and then add this. It, it's, it complete, it's completely disruptive to judo. Sure. Absolutely. Just this. The half, you, know, you have to completely rework judo to make it work past being hit in the face. Mm -hmm. You know? You know, it's and, funny. Yeah. I've heard the same thing about uh, leg locks with that wrestlers bring into uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, the ground, mm -hmm. you know, the ground game. They said mm -hmm. once, uh, and I forget where I read this, but it was it was a Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioner, I think, that talked about this. It may have been John Danaher, but, but don't quote me on that one. But he mm -hmm. said once once you bring in leg locks, you now take away about eighty percent of Brazilian jiu-jitsu's ground game, the intricate. Tetris of legs yeah. and joints and stuff because you snatch that leg or heel hook and it's over. And so it, it's been one of those uh, influences that has, firstly, it made the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu people pretty uh, resentful because they said, well, we got this really great, cool, intricate chess game and now you've taken most of the pieces away. Yeah. But then when they realize, okay, we're going to bring the leg locks in, it, it just it changes it to being a simpler, more direct. Uh, type thing you gotta be careful you cannot raise your legs or put mm -hmm. them near uh you know somebody's upper body because they'll snatch them very quickly yeah and having worked some leg locks they're a lot they are a lot of fun but they're pretty demoralizing when you're <laughs> yeah. dangled by your by your leg you know hanging upside down by your leg yeah. um so actually that kind of bridges us into the 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 big rabbit hole uh discussion okay. about competitions yes and uh it seems that that tamiki was very interested in the the benefits of competition and i think maybe the the beginning of this conversation can be uh firstly what was more highway shiba's objections to competition precisely if there I, and i've never heard anybody that claims to know exactly what what those objections were um and then why uh there was not a rift between him and tamiki when tamiki started to bring in a competitive format uh in well, there was this is what I've always heard. I don't know the details of it, right? Okay, well, fill, fill us in. I'm, I'm interested to okay. hear this. All I know is that it wasn't with Weishiba himself, but with the Aiki or the Hombo Dojo. Okay. They said, uh, please stop doing competition or change the name. Mm -hmm. And apparently he chose to keep the name and keep doing competition when he was not invited back. Okay. Well, and, as I understand it, Morahai himself never said, all right, Kenji, Tamiki, stop doing this. It was no. He himself, I believe, did not say that. Right. It was not a rift between the founder, um, yeah. but that would make sense that the 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 rift was between, you know, subordinates of of more high. Yeah, um, I actually was trying to research this a little more. Hmm. Um, I have not found anything definitive yet about when that conversation actually took place. Hmm. You know, but you uh, know, and that's yeah, something that maybe and this i was just thinking about this uh, yesterday and today was mm -hmm. it has mainstream aikido been victim of the marketing message of what the image of aikido is supposed to be which kind of started getting shifted and changed back in the think about the six late 60s and 70s yeah uh being that it was you know or even post-war I've, I've heard the argument that well you know once the allies occupied they restricted martial art training um and, uh, and aikido in order to try to survive not being shut down yes rebranded itself to not sound like it was a martial art and in mm -hmm. doing so did it start to have that message be the sort of the the flat the rallying flag that 
that the practitioners all went to, which took it away from being trained like it was a martial art. And maybe that's kind of an obscure description, but uh, no, I, I get what you mean. Like you're saying there. that maybe it was a marketing thing that it got very spiritual. Right. And it's, it would be one thing to say, okay, guys, we're, we're going to train this as a martial art, but we're not going to tell anybody. We're going to, this is the image we're going <laughs> to put on the window. And, but when we get inside, we're training. Yeah. And it, it's kind of that from what I've heard, it that's sort of how it was because the people that I've talked to personally who've trained in the 50s and 60s said that was hard training. It wasn't like, you know, it wasn't fluffy and, and, and that's, that's nonsensical. It was serious. You know, it yeah. was, you know. Wasn't, didn't you have the nickname Hell Dojo? Yeah, Hell, exactly. And, and, and so I, I, that's where it painted the picture to me of the image being painted to the general public was a little different than what it was when you stepped onto the mat. Well, now take that a few decades into the future. Now, when you step on the mat, it certainly lives up to what that image is supposed to be to in, in a lot of dojos where so, so are you saying way was never really against competition that's what i'm wondering and we're yeah. left because it, it, what he said was pretty vague now i did see somebody uh who posted about a translation they said his words about uh there should be no competition in aikido they said would be better translated as do not have a rivalry with your training partners or do not um have basically any animosity with yes. your, with your training partners. Now, I don't speak Japanese and I don't know yeah. the original Japanese. Yeah. But there seems to be great debate and uh argue arguments over what meaning, what like was competition the fact that there should not be a sport developed or yeah. is competition of the there should not be I guess what Bruce Lee would call emotional content in yeah. in your training. Well, I, I don't know a combat sportsman that doesn't complain about the rules that they fight under, right? Sure, Everybody absolutely. has an opinion. Yep, um, yep. And it's not as if sporting, the sport application doesn't have a bad side, you know, it's bad sides. Mm -hmm. It's again, it's a question of balance. Mm -hmm. um, and if I, I could complain, I hate the, you know, in judo, we have, a, there's a rule that says, you know, you, the one side rule, right? You can't be on one side for too long. Okay. It's not, it's where you can only grab if if I have both hands on one side, I can only hold that for three seconds. Mm -hmm. That's 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 it's bread and butter. Right? That's how you get to someone's back. Sure. Not being able to hang out here so that it looks pretty. No leg grabs. Big people complain about it a lot. But at the same time, having gone through the effort of trying to come up with rule sets, it's not easy. I mean, it's I so I have sympathy for the people who have to deal with this, you know, and sure. deal with them. Um, but nonetheless. Yeah, there are problems, and I, and there's certainly maybe a psychological danger, right? Mm -hmm. You've you've seen it. I, even in oh, yeah. when I was at wrestling in high school, there was, you know, those guys were a little too angry, injured mm -hmm. their partners a little too often. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny. Every style has, you know, when they've gone too far. There's there's no word. It's sort of an unwritten rule. Ah, that was too hard. Wrestling has it. Judo has it. Aikido has it. Shotokan Aikido has it. You know, when they went too far. And Muay Thai too, right? It's like mm -hmm. you said, like that's that's a thing that you just absorb being at the school for a while, at the dojo right. or the gym, saying, oh, "This is how hard we go here." In um, fact, I, I think that that's and having coming from, come from a full contact background that had exactly what mm -hmm. you're talking about. Like there's a yeah. line, there's the rules that everybody can read and understand, and then there's the unspoken yes. line of what you okay. can do and what you can't do <laughs> and a lot of it has to do with what happens when your skill level is up here and their skill skill level is down there like you mm -hmm. don't have it's not written anywhere but you don't have seniors just pounding on junior students uh yeah. or practitioners um but i and i think this is one of those things where yeah you know in high school you get a lot of young young people their personalities are not developed yet they're not they haven't learned about interperson yeah relations quite yet they're still kind of there's clumsy i mean nobody comes out of high school and says that was a great experience everybody's like oh i would never want to do that again um yeah. and, but i think that the path of that competition is where you start to learn uh the importance of those limitations the importance of honorable behavior of spirited endeavor but you have a line where you are not going to take advantage of you know somebody else's weakness you're not going to hurt them you know unnecessarily or that sort of thing and that's where you know I, I i when i got into competition i despised it i didn't like what it brought up in me emotionally but 
I got to the point where I, I felt like this is a language I have to learn. I have yeah. to understand what this, what this is. And what I saw not only in myself, but in other people that, that could speak that language better is that there was a tempering there that, that, that to me is what a gentleman uh, or a lady or a warrior has. They may have tremendous power or prowess or, or skill, but they know when not to cross the line. They know the importance of restraint yeah. when it, when that's needed. Um, yeah. And the but, judgment uh, to know when okay. it needs to be applied, uh, yeah. you know, and, and that's something that, that I guess lackadaisical or light duty training just will not give you. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think, you know, all the qual, you know, I think those qualifications aside, obviously I have gone into the second camp, right. Um, sure. As far as favoring competition. Mm -hmm. And um, I do think it's the answer that a lot of people, you know, I think, who was it, Rokas, Lenny Sly, those folks who are um, Wolfman, you know? It's like, yeah, Dan the yeah. Wolfman, yeah. Isolate this range and then compete at this range, and that's how you develop this skill set, right? Sure. In the same way boxers isolate boxing, mm -hmm. so they can just work that range and not worry about getting you know, taken down. Um, so not only is competition good, but, but isolated competition, focused competition, you develop that skill set. Then you can combine it. You know, and you develop those instincts to, and those eyes to say, oh, someone's a little off balance and I'll throw them. Oh, someone's someone's hand is, you know, in a position for, for uh, a wrist uh, sure. technique of some kind. Yeah, um, the, the, the live stuff. Can, uh, Go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry. And she I doesn't have to. She has the competition. Right. But Randori, you're free to be a little bit more experimental, you know, experimental. Mm -hmm. And that's what we often do, you know. So yes, there's very rigid rules. And you want to make sure everybody goes home nice and safe at a, you know, regular official competition. You show up, you do your thing, you go home. That's one thing. And there's a lot of very high stakes, right? Because your team, your team is depending on you. Uh, maybe your girlfriend or boyfriend's in the audience, and you don't want to be embarrassed, right? It's very high stakes. And this guy is not going to cut you any slack. He's not from your school. He has no respect for you. He wants to win for the same reason. But it's very rigid, right? It's very tight. You can't do certain things. When you're back at your school, you have some of those problems. There's a cadence that students fall into. There's a bit of, you know, maybe a little deference to the higher students or so on. But you can be more experiment, experimental there. And, and so you, have, you need both. Right? You get your randori, you get your shiite. And um, I think they're both necessary. Right? You have to, in other words, there has to be not just randori, I mean competition. You have to compete with people and other schools. That you've never met. Mm -hmm. you, know? you know, one thing that that I, I think is a main point of resistance for the idea of of either competing or bringing a certain amount of that competitive intensity to training yeah. is that it will bring out the ugly side of of people. And and I don't know what your experience is with with uh, with Shotokan and and competing there, but from my experience, and I've competed with tens of thousands of practitioners for yeah. 25 plus years, I will say that the dark side of that competitive thing does exist, yes. but it's, it's remarkably rare. I would say less than one to 2% of, of mm -hmm. people that I knew that competed were of the, I'll cheat to win. I don't care about my opponents um, mm -hmm. that were that kind of that psychopath. Yes. Yeah. The, the other, the other 98, yeah. 99% were all we're all doing the same thing. We want to be better. Uh, we love doing what we do. We want to help each other as much as we want to better ourselves. It wasn't like, you know, the Gordon Gecko character, you know, the greed is good and you mm -hmm. know, the, the ruthless uh, yeah. type of competitor that most people envision. Um, that I've found tends to get flushed out pretty fast. If somebody comes in with that kind of an attitude, generally, they learn pretty quickly that a they're not at the top of the food chain, and when you're not at the top of the food chain, the people that are that are up at the top will tend to correct your attitude, and usually do it with a bit of yeah. uh, pain pain compliance. If you're if you're not getting the message through verbally of mm -hmm. hey you gotta you gotta adjust your attitude, it will be corrected in other ways, mm -hmm. um, and the point will be driven home. Um, what is your experience with with that darker side of competition? Uh, exactly as yours, right? I could count on one hand in, you know, what, 30-something 
years to people I've met that feel that, mm-hmm. th- that behave that way. Right. You know, one wrestler, maybe one guy in, you know, karate or something like that. Um, I do think that there's a danger too. Like, I think even in a, on the spiritual side, right, there's a, what they call spiritual materialism. Mm-hmm. There's a great book with that name, by that name that I would recommend. Um, and you've seen that too, right? So I'd say that same 1% of psychos and, you know, that are going to hurt you in competition Sure. And uh, as there's that also that one percent of people who are wearing that spiritual clothing or that metaphysical clothing as a kind of ego uh, dressing, and they've just replaced one form of bullying with another. You know? you know, and where I've seen that in the martial arts world, in arts that do not have <laughs> any sort of a competitive uh, venue where yeah. somebody can has a bit, a bit more pride than they should, a bit more hubris and they strut around, once they go compete, you find out whether they have what they're, you know, whether they can walk the walk as well as talk the talk or they can't. Yeah. When you have an art that does, doesn't have any of that, now you can kind of have egos run uh, like a runaway train. They just sort of get, people kind of yeah. get filled on what they can do because they were they do kata really well or they, they got a, you know, a certain amount of rank or prestige within their group or their organization. And it almost seems like a self-serving kind of cycle that competition will shatter. Um, And that's a part of competition that I actually, that I I liked. There was a bit of a reality check. Yeah, it takes away any illusions you might have are gone. Right, and and that that for us as martial artists will, you know, eliminate things where we believe it, something will work and we find out that only when we put it under pressure against an ambitious opponent that it works or it doesn't. And I think that that's an important factor, whether there's a sport or there isn't. Uh, training has to have an ambitious attacker to, to finally prove something. Yeah. And I would like to point out something that we're sort of, I think we're taking for granted that we're both, obviously the name of your, your podcast, we both want to pursue uh, martial effectiveness, mm-hmm. right? That that's our aim. And, and I would say to people, like, that it doesn't necessarily mean you want to fight or that you Correct. are even preparing. Like, I don't think I'll ever get into a street fight. I think the likelihood of me getting into a street fight now, you know, I'll be 50 in a few months, um, is probably as close to zero as anyone cares to be. Mm-hmm. But I still believe to pursue that because whatever wisdom there is to be drawn from this practice, this exercise, um, is by following the same path that my sort of predecessors did, you know, and I'm not going to try to draw some kind of shortcut and say, okay, I'm just going to go straight to the metaphysical side. No, they had to, they had to find themselves there because they were thinking about life and death all the time. And then it put their minds in, into the spiritual, into the metaphysical. Sure. And so you have to do the same thing. Yeah. And you have to practice for effectiveness because form has to follow function. Mm-hmm. So even if you're never going to fight, I have no problem walking away from I mean, it. Just, it's not even on my map. I still practice as if I'm going to fight. Well, yeah, exactly. And, you know, Plato not only was a philosopher, but a wrestler. He was a very <laughs> accomplished wrestler um, and a powerful yeah. one. You know, yeah. and, and the, the philosophy that you combine the, the physical prowess with mm-hmm. the intelligence and the thoughtfulness and the introspection, I think yeah. that truly is the perfect, as, as close as you get to be a perfect person, a balanced yeah. person would probably be a better description. Yeah. But when it comes to it, it's not the, the man or the woman who starts a fight. It, to me, it's the one who ends, ends a fight. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, like you, I probably won't get into a hand-to-hand you know, into a fight, but I also don't want to be beaten in a fight. Like mm-hmm. that's my goal is to, to defy being victimized. Yeah. And whether that means, you know, leaving when I see trouble starting to brew and I don't want to be any part of it, mm-hmm. but with the, the caveat, I don't want to leave an innocent person to, to be victimized either. Yeah. Um, and that, that, you know, we could get into a, go down the moral rabbit hole of that one of, you know, you obviously have family, you have even innocent bystanders that you can leave, but are somebody else going to get 
going to get beaten up. Yeah. Um, you know, and everybody's answer is going to be different. I don't, I wouldn't expect that there's any standard or any, um, you know, any superior uh, view that's, you know, better than any other. Um, but I think it's something that's important as we are practicing an art that that's what it's built for. In my opinion, this art has been built and honed for ending physical violence. And, yeah, uh, and, and that's why I got into this, right? So I don't know. You know, that's my my handle on on Reddit, which is where I sort of made my home and trying to market this stuff is NY Tamiki. I grew up in New York City in the Bronx and in the 70s and 80s. And, you know, this was there was nothing about this. It was about movies. This was about, you know, I needed something, mm -hmm. you know, um, it was not a you know, it, it was a very bad time in New York, right, in the late 70s, early 80s. As bad as it ever got and it was necessary it wasn't something that i did for fun or exercise or choice it was just staying alive you know and as soon as i can get on the bus and leave i did <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and there's you know there are times and this is something where you know i've heard many practitioners will say well i just walk away i'll just just leave yeah. which sometimes you can that's yeah, cool sometimes. if you can when you're taking the same walk home though yeah. from the bus stop to your house no you can't right um so just sometimes you get cornered i i know a friend of mine got cornered in a uh it was a rest stop on a highway or you know they were driving cross country and the guy with a knife you know came in the front door which there was only one door to the restroom in this rest stop and yeah. said you know give me all your money you're cornered you can't go anywhere else um yeah. not to say that he should have fought i think he you know gave up his wallet and that was it so you know yeah. to me that was a cheap lesson there are many ways to end the violence part but yeah. it that doesn't mean that one solution will fit everything mm -hmm. and you know there's plenty of accounts of people being forced into fighting for their uh their survival and yeah. and that's i think a right that every every being every animal fish has to to be able to fight to live and not be yeah you know not be dominated or having having their life taken away um well, but, let me ask, that's then we get into the philosophy part of you know yeah well that's that's what the meat is um yeah, yeah. but let me ask you this um just to kind of go back to competition sure one of the things that, that i'd sort of had to contend with was the two big misconceptions conceptions that i get when i was trying to sort of discuss this um with folks online where one there's no competition say so, well there is a there is a branch that competes um and then from i Contemporary Aikido was it, and I've actually seen this quote more than once. That's sterile, mm -hmm. or I have certainly gotten pushed back that Aikido. There's no place for competition in Aikido. Do you, could you explain the sterile aspect to me? Do you think? Sure, you know, and and I th okay. granted this is only my own opinion, but I think when you see practitioners that are clearly executing well honed choreography. Mm -hmm. where there is not where any uh intention or bruce lee's emotional content has been removed all you have is two people that are performing movements that are complementary to me yeah. that's what a sterile uh execution would look like in fact mm -hmm. i've seen practitioners look bored because they they know the, their choreography really well um mm -hmm. there there's no real well, no, that Tamiki Aikido competition is sterile, or the competitive. Oh, Aikido oh, okay. Um, I've not heard that that the Tamiki com competition is sterile, um, so I, I can't speak to that. That oh. part. Um, the, or, I will so, say what is this? Where? I've what is the source? It, of, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The source of the anti-competitive sentiment in general, which I, I would say that that comes from Osensei. The quote from Osensei that maybe being Maybe misunderstood not. or from the, the sort of twisted marketing message that Aikido is about peace and about harmony, which even the, the term harmony seems to be mm -hmm. viewed as tranquility, like yeah. it's the art of tranquility. Like it's not really a martial art is not about tranquility. It's about restoring mm -hmm. disharmony into into harmony. And, and the, the phrase that, that I've heard that I love, which is harmony is a nail sticking out of the banister that catches on people's clothes and you hit it with a hammer 
the hitting it with the hammer restores the harmony and clothes aren't ripped on it anymore or toes aren't stubbed or things like that. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that over time, this, the, the peace and harmony message or the image that's been painted has been misunderstood in the fact that the goal might be peace, but that's not the method. Mm -hmm. And I think practitioners have gotten to the point where they think that peace is the method of restoring harmony when somebody yeah. introduces violence or discord yeah. that you can use peace to resolve it. Sometimes you can, but um, in many cases, there has to be some level of not only drawing the line, but enforcing that line saying, no, you're not going to cause harm here and, and have to, you know, do something about that. Mm -hmm. um, I say, I would say probably the most innovative use of that would have been uh, Mahatma Gandhi in the yeah. tactics that he used in trying to free India from British rule. He didn't use outright violence where he would get mobs of people together that would start to destroy things, but he would certainly get those people together to apply pressure, yeah. but it, it was in a, I would say it's violence, but it was in a nonviolent way, um, if that makes sense. So yeah. Yeah. Clear, clearly drawing a boundary and enforcing the boundary with the people that he had behind him. Yeah. Um, but that didn't mean he was harming other people um, in, in, in his pursuits of getting what he wanted. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, and to me, that's where, where the morality, I guess, comes into play. And uh, even the word violence, uh, which is often mistaken for purely the use of physical force, mm -hmm. the, 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 the root of the word violence is to violate. So if somebody uh, intrudes on another person, that, that's a violation. Like I grab you and you don't want me grabbing you, that's a violation of you. Mm -hmm. uh, but if, if I grab you, you're not violating me by resisting my attempt to control you. Um, no, you might use physical force to do that, but you are not, you are not enacting violence. I was the one who initiated it. The violation is, is mine upon you. Um, again, we're getting into a pretty good, uh, philosophy, philosophy yeah. hole here, but, yeah. uh, I mean, but we could talk about more, yeah, yeah. more concrete matters, like what the competition right. is like. And, and where I think this comes down to, how does it affect your training? Yeah. Whereas, you know, I run across Aikido practitioners that have never done a shomenate or ne because it's aggressive and they're, yeah. oh, that's too aggressive. That's too, you yeah. know, uh, too forceful Too, uh, you know, and the same thing goes with a temi. And I know you wanted to talk about a temi a little bit today too, yeah. Yeah. which is, you know, well, we should, we shouldn't strike. That's, that's somehow barbaric or, or, um, mm -hmm. you know, to me, it's, it's not, it's just, that's the part of the physical engagement that you didn't start. Yeah, but you're there to put an end to the the violence, that violation part. Um, so, and many Aikido practitioners they they don't they can't hit hard, they can't strike. You know, yeah. they can make a fist and sort of stick it on you, but you know, a <laughs> lot of them would I would I'd take the hardest shot that they could deliver all day long, and it wouldn't. Mm -hmm. You know, granted there are exceptions. There's some some practitioners that can hit like a freight train, sure. and you know that's. To me, it's important as a good martial artist, you should be able to hit hard. Like there's no excuse. If yeah. nothing for nothing else, you allow your training partner to see and experience what a real hard strike would look like and how to how to properly deal with it. Um, yeah. So that bridges us up to, into the Atemi. So maybe we could talk about okay. that a little bit because um, you wanted to talk about the dual nature of Atemi Waza. Yeah. So he wrote in one of the, again, one of the things he wrote in the book, and he's talked about it a few times to make it has. He was basically looking to add a Temiwaza to the fuller, modernized jiu-jitsu, sport mm -hmm. jiu-jitsu, judo, what he called judo. And um, but he was very he was definitely uh, interested in keeping it safe. Right. We want to keep it safe. He wants people to go home. And the way I see it, you have a number, every martial art has its own solution. Like, so they say judo is probably one of the most injury prone martial arts, but it's not, you typically don't get brain injury. Mm -hmm. And I think he, he sort of touched on the subject. We didn't know much about CTE back in the day. We know a lot more now. Um, CTE? Um, sorry. Um, 
it's a, a chronic traumatic encephalopathy, I believe is what okay. it stands for. Okay. And which is what you get when you have repeated uh, hits to the skull, basically. Right. And, and I remember reading a paper, something in the neighborhood of like 40% of amateur boxers had evidence of CTE. Okay. And the problem with CTE is it's not a, it's not a full concussion that you can diagnose, right? And it wasn't diagnosable until about 10, 15 years ago that mm. you even had CTE. And in fact, to properly, to even confirm you have it, you actually have to die first and they have to look at your brain. Oh, okay. You know, okay. so we don't That's even know, convenient. we know very little about it. But we do know that sports like boxing have it, have it. football has, you know, mm -hmm. football players get it. Um, it has been linked to, you know, it is likely linked to major uh, behavioral changes, almost often for the worse, mm -hmm. uh, a cognitive decline. So whatever joint injuries you get from judo or BJJ, or certainly, you know, I've had three, you know, eh, three surgeries, one, two of them were Aikido related. Um, my brain will be okay, right? Because I'm not getting bopped in the head too much. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, if you want to develop a defense, you have to, uh, the head has to be a target. Mm -hmm. So how do you reconcile this? And I believe this is what Timiki was trying to do with the Tendi Waza. Make the head a target, but still keep your brain relatively safe. Mm -hmm. And the solution is palm strikes. Right. Essentially. But also not just palm strikes, palm, uh, what we, he talked about it, Atemi Waza having two modes, which was the physiological damage, which would be if you're, you're, you're leveraging your arm, your elbow, and you make it into a strike. Tiny alteration, move it more from your hips, it's more of a push. Mm. And so what you end up with something that would track the same path as a strike, straight to your head, requires the same evasion and defense as a proper strike, you know, a, a strike, but it's a toshu, it's a, it's a toppling. Mm. And so I think he was trying to find a balance that's somewhere on the spectrum of, okay, no head strikes to like Kyoko Shinkai or head gloves or palm strikes like Pancrase. And so it's on that spectrum. Mm -hmm. It's probably just before headgear and just after, you know, so it's, it's, not the, sure. it's not the safest, right? Because a lot of styles don't allow head strikes at all. Mm -hmm. um, but in order to at least make the head a target and inculcate good motion, we he chose this approach and i and it took me 20 years to appreciate that you know to really go wait a second that's brilliant you know right. and that's that's been my well, i'd say like that's been my journey with Tamika Kido all the time it's like every time i thought i was looking at something oh that's a historic artifact i'll memorize it but i'm never going to use it and then i go oh that that does work sure. and then, so sure. it's been a lot of that i mean it's but so that is so if you're doing judo, if you're doing BJJ, you're doing a grappling style, and the sentiment that a lot of people, I hear from a lot of folks that do this, that do a grappling style, they do so because they want to A, learn how to fight, and B, they don't want to get punched in the brain, right? <laughs> they don't want to have, they don't want CTE. Um, this is it. This is, this is the one style, maybe sumo, right? Sumo, is basically, tell me, if you've seen sumo, you've seen a tummy. Sure. You've seen uh, Tamika Tamaros. It's the only other style that practices that. But it's see, basically a shoving strike. Mm -hmm. It's not a full-on punch, but it's not it's not just shove either. It's somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. And this is that thing we kind of learn by practice exactly how far, how hard we're allowed to go. It, there's, a, there's a sort of a sweet spot. Um, and I do think it, it strikes the right balance of learning how to defend, protect your head, on pain of getting thrown, right? Because you need that, you need to get caught mm -hmm. or else you're never going to learn, you know, mm -hmm. this. Right? Sure. As, you know, it's uh, funny you mentioned that because I found the very same thing. In fact, I was uh, shown this years ago by a mentor. We were working on, you know, pugilism uh, mm -hmm. defenses and whatnot and, and yeah. showing a bit of that. And he, he explained about the open hand strikes and just like you described that they're substitutes for, for a fist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, within there, uh, the idea that, you know, Chris, we we're used to seeing a, 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 a wadded up fist hitting somebody's head. Well, you can do that with wraps and gloves on, yeah. but when you do it barehanded, the head, the skull is pretty much armor. I mean, you're hitting yes. a very hard bone with, with, yeah. with your knuckles. And so really practically, 
hitting with with your open hand, um, particularly the, the the bone, can hit as hard. In fact, I think Boss Rutten wound up when he went over to Japan and and brought the that empty hand, the bone strike in. He started knocking people out with it, and I yeah. think that's where he broke the or he, he ruptured his opponent's spleen uh, with a body shot. Um, and then he, he recreated it uh, on, I think it was Fight Science or something, where they put together a torso, with clear yeah. torso with a, with a pig spleen in it. So do you think you could do it again? And he's like, yeah, I could. And they showed this in slow motion as he came in with that palm strike to, the, to the, what would be the right side of the torso. And you just see that spleen explode. And, and right from, I mean, they had a rib cage and everything in there. Um, wow. So I mean, it's, it is a very powerful strike, but yeah. What I found in training these things, and I've even got white belts where I'll start them off with, with sparring, you know, going to the head with the empty hand, mm -hmm. is it builds uh, familiarity with it quickly without it being frightening. And like you said, yes. without getting people hurt either by getting hit in the head, which if you're going light is not really that big of a, yeah. of a risk. It also treats the flinch response too. Right. But, but what is, is hurting the hands. If you're not, if you're not wearing gloves and you hit somebody on the skull, even... Yeah like half power, it still stings the hands. And I mean, those are small bones. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I think, I think, you know, it's, I guess I smile a little bit. Maybe I rediscovered yeah. what something Tamiki was doing. I didn't even realize that, that he took yeah. that approach, but it, it does make sense. And I've been playing with this with my students for years now to, and found yeah. it very successful um, as well as, you know, it brings out what you talked about that control of the restraint of knowing just how much, power you do get the targeting you do get you know how to apply the, the penetration mm -hmm. and when you can do that calmly in a dojo setting when you're not terrified for your life you add a bit of of adrenaline to it and it's going to be hitting harder whether yes. you want it to or not and yes. the thing that i like about it the most is it doesn't hurt the hands yeah. even if you do hit really hard with it and mm -hmm. second it will adjust it'll tip ahead it'll turn ahead when you hit it will mm -hmm. it will affect the posture which to me is where atemi was always described to me as an unbalancing strike yes and it fits that perfectly um and it can it can even be you know powerful to the to the torso to the legs mm -hmm. shoulders arms um i've, I've seen top i've seen showing out to square to the chest toss Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and it doesn't have to slide into being a, you know, chopped to the windpipe or anything like that, yeah. but with the body structure behind it, you know, yeah. and, and that's where, whether it's empty hand or, or, you know, with a fist or what have you, but I think every martial artist needs to be able to hit hard. Yeah. It make, you have to make your opponent a little concerned that they're going to get hit if they are yes. not. Yeah. Now he won't, an opponent on, on a street probably won't know, but all it takes is one stupid strike that they know is pointless or your inability to do it yeah. and now you know that that's a, a glaring weakness um and something to be to be exploited you may only have a second or two why waste it with with something that is going to be of no effect it won't stop mm -hmm. the violence it won't take posture it won't serve really at all so mm -hmm. I think if anything, the, the, re, the real fight, uh, I should say real fight, but a self-defense application is different from sport in the fact that you're pretty sure that this is going to be over in a few seconds. You, yeah. Time is very precious. You do not have the, the, the luxury of feeling an opponent out or starting to faint and manipulate and draw them and, and you know, deal with cunning maneuvering and pressures. It's generally like a, a, a hurricane that hits, just comes blowing in and it's... Yeah, it's done. I, and we could probably do a whole nother show on the differences yes. between real world violence and then sport violence. But I do think yes. that there's understanding the thing about sport that I, I do appreciate. And I think this is a value is being able to read movements, understand motion, uh, mm -hmm. both at speed and, and pace and tempo, understand pressure. These are all things that sterile kata tend to not do very well. Yeah. Like there's certain things that kata do, definitely do very well, but you know, you, you, it's not everything most yeah. certainly. Well, to, to what you just said, as far as like, uh, both things, right. We're talking about a Temi on the scale of realism versus, uh, safety, but speed 
mm -hmm. and realism, but uh, I guess unsafe. Sure. Okay. Again, to, to use, say, wrestling as a metaphor. Wrestling is designed for high school kids. It's very safe to practice. You get bruised up and everything, but there, you can't do, you know, you can't even do a headlock in wrestling. You have to right. grab the arm to, mm -hmm. if you're going to headlock somebody. It's a head and arm hold, mm -hmm. just so that you're not ten, putting too much tension on just the neck. Sure. And yet, no one would deny that, in spite of all these regulations on behavior, that wrestling could, by itself, be a good self-defense form. Right? Absolutely. So, mm -hmm. And another, and this is another bit of genius, I think, that went into the development of, of Temiwaza as practiced in Tamika Aikido and to some degree sumo, um, was that in spite of the fact that it's safe, you don't have to change it to be useful as a self-defense response. Right? Um, as you said, it's probably for if you're for a lot of people, it's probably beneficial to punch with the palm, right? It's because my own hand is safer. Uh, palm strikes by no means are soft. And um, so th without any change, you can use it in sport at speed and you can use it in self-defense at speed. Um, if I was a really good boxer, you know, I've, I've, I've gone to gym. By the way, if you've never been to a box gym, go to a boxing gym just to see what real punching looks like and see if you can double leg take down somebody who can punch as fast as these like insanely fast kids. I mean, I watch yep. these two, these seven year olds. I'm, I'm fortunate there's one not too you know, a few miles from me, I go occasionally. But there, you know, you're not gonna you're not gonna outbox a boxer. I forget what I was talking about <laughs> because I got sidetracked. But sure. the point is, it works in sport and it works in, in self defense. Is it perfectly ideal? Could I catch you? You know, if I was a good boxer, would I be able to just catch your chin and knock you out and just hit that button? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't need that. This works. Right. And if I miss you, I'm gonna I can throw you. If, if it's not physiologically damaging, it'll be dynamically damaging, right? Which is, again, talking about the dual nature of a temius, physiological and dynamic mm -hmm. target. And they're all there. It's so well thought out. And you know, it's, and that, very, it's a very crafted system. Sure. I, you know, and that brings up a point that I was, I've been discussing with my students recently, and that is, um, you know, if you get an attacker that approaches you and you make a movement such as that shomenate and they back off. Yeah. That's a victory. If, yeah. if you've just kept them away from you, because yeah. you, know, you don't need to have, have it look like a, you know, uh, like a movie scene where you do some big dramatic throw for the, the, you know, mm -hmm. the end goal. Um, and that can be whether you've just shifted position, you've moved in such a way that they have to take the long way to get to you, which I, I kind of like that idea of, because that's how you, you deal with a faster opponent. Is yeah. You always make them take a long way around to get to you, and you deny them that very short, usually mm -hmm. the middle line, but you step outside their foot so they have to turn to face you, even with these small shifts. Uh, things like that, where you show that you know what you're doing, even though you haven't completely twisted them into a pretzel yet, yeah. can be enough for, for them to just go, oh, maybe I'm, maybe I'm in over my head. I'm, screw it. I'm leaving. Yeah. To me, that, that was total victory, uh, yeah. you know, decisive without having to to get into an engagement. Um, and I, I think, think even that, in, again, taking self-defense, uh, a self-defense scenario mm -hmm. into account, let's say the, the nature of a temiwaza is that you have to move more of your body. Mm -hmm. And people joke about, oh, punch has to be from the hip or has to be, you use your legs to punch. And martial arts tradition is very much from the body. Mm -hmm. But one of the first, one of the early things you learn in boxing is they'll tie your ankles together. You're, you're literally force you to just punch from your arm, you know, and to give you that skill as well. The fact is punching from your arm can work, right? There's no rules. This is a good punch. You know, that's a good punch. That's a way to do it. You can do it this way. I mean, it, everything has a time and place, mm -hmm. including punching just from your arm. And the fact is punching from just your arm is way faster than punching from your body. And it takes a lot of work to get to a place where punching with your whole body is even approach, approximating the speed of just moving your hand. You know, sort of Wing Chun way, you know, real quick. Or, you know, yeah, and Sistema has some very interesting arm punches that are yeah. really obscure, but uh, right. but they hit hard. I mean, it's surprisingly hard for yeah. how they work. But, but if you but if you put the time in, the point is, you put the time in, you're maybe you're not gonna outbox, you know, a golden gloves guy or even a regional, you know, boxing guy, mm -hmm. but you're going to outbox eight ninety percent of the people. Even doing a shomenate slow that doesn't have the advantage of 
reflexively expanding your arm the whole way, right? Because you're moving more of your whole body for uh, the strike. Um, so you're still you're still going to sort of you're still covering a good percentage of the population. And right. given that you're used to things flying at you too, you can defend reasonably well. Because mm -hmm. again, the, the shomanate is has so many aspects, but one of its aspects is to teach defense mm -hmm. and give you an accurate representation of a punch that you can sure. try to avoid. Cool. Yeah, um, yeah I, I love shomanate uh, in, in its many forms. Uh, yeah. Control in that head is, it's just, once you get that yeah. head tipped somewhere, like you, you're, in, you're driving the bus. Uh, yes. Control is definitely there. I'm stealing that. Yep. And, uh, you know, I, I remember one of the first times I tried it, I was in a, um, and this was after I started getting used to it, but I was not thoroughly confident with it yet, but I was in a randori. We had, I think, four, four ukes, and I had one of them charge me, and it was a fellow student, but he was not quite my height, but, you know, heavier. And yeah. I brought that shomanate up, and he didn't see it. it, came up from under the chin, and I just laid him right out. Yeah. And they were, they were all, all the ukes were, doing a run like they were beyond fast walk they were they were hauling all of them slowed down instantly when they saw that <laughs> like when he got back up he was going at maybe a walk and i didn't blast him i didn't like pound his head in it just dropped him very surprisingly yeah and i yeah. talked to him afterwards he's like it didn't hurt me it just shocked me like i didn't i didn't see it and suddenly i was off my feet yeah. um and that means he did it good right if there was no shock even Right. One of the things about it, if it's done right, and this is probably this is true with judo too, when it's done right, even the person getting thrown doesn't really hurt, right? You just right, yeah. Him. He got up, but everyone who saw that happen just kind of their eyes got big, and they just, they went from a run to a to a walk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Deterrence but, very important. It was a very Especially interesting competition. Attack. I mean, when I was surprised of it, I didn't think it would go that well because I, you know, still trying to get used to it. Yeah. Um, so. Okay. Well, cool. We're coming up on, on about 90 minutes. So were there any points that we did not get to that you'd uh, like to discuss? I want everybody to go try it out. Go join a competition. Mm -hmm. right? That's what I want. You know, take your Aikido, learn the rules, download them, play with it in your dojo, you know, your school. Try to fight by the rules. And then the next time TAA, Tamiki, yeah, it's the TAA is the Tamiki Association of America, puts on a competition, show up. They'll let you in, I'm sure. It's like, hey, you know, we have all these guys. They learn the rules. Okay, go try it out. I mean, um, I if there's one problem with Tamiki Aikido, it's not as popular as I'd like it to be. The fact that it's not yeah, really popular no means Tamiki a talent pool. The city huh? that I'm in, huh? I know there's not a Tamiki dojo in. I, in your I think in the state. I don't know where the nearest one is. Is there one in Chicago? I'll find out. I okay, that would be probably the closest I would imagine. But yeah, there's. I don't think there's a lot of dojos, Tamiki dojos around the U.S. But I haven't, you know, I haven't gone looking for them, so I'm not sure. Yeah. And if, if you're trying to, if, if you're thinking about, if if you're wrestling with the idea of Aikido and being martially effective, this is your route. You don't have to. Uh, uh, there's a sport ready made for you. You have the tools. Come and you know try it out. Sure. If you're a judo guy, this was made for you too to add some judo, to, to add an, an additional range. And it, it's literally designed to feather right in. It's a Lego piece. Um, and if you don't do judo, go do judo too. Sorry, if you're an Aikido <laughs> guy, you have to learn some judo. At Always least get like a green belt, you know, like just, just so that you can't, you know, you're not just a complete sitting duck for a Koji Gary or something, right. you know, do, do a little bit of judo. And cross training is fine. It's healthy. It doesn't mean you're abandoning your style um, or anything like that or, giving up on it it's you're we're just trying to examine jujitsu as a whole like you know you know even bjj right that's probably you know, swing a dead cat you find a bjj school that if you want to do a deep dive and literally one of the four pillars of jujitsu that's the, the nagiwaza there you have that ready it's all the same style and then you throw in some risk you know some risk techniques and sure. get them really annoyed with you over there and then uh We've seen their memes, right? They they love their wrists. Oh yeah, locks and they allow it, which is great. A lot of schools allow wrist locks, so it's a great place to practice. Cool. Um, but judo, BJJ, Aikido are are part of a spectrum, and um, if you don't want to get punched in the head, Aikido is a great striking range art to add. If you're a grappler, mm -hmm. and if you're in Aikido, come and compete. Let's do it. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. This has been a great conversation, Al. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you.
Excellent. And I'm going to uh, put a link up. Uh, I'll find you a school too. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to do the uh, put a link to your subreddit in case people are interested in going and checking that out too. Please. Appreciate it. Excellent. Well, you have a great rest of your day and we'll talk to you again soon. All right, bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Stay tuned for more episodes. I've got some great stuff on the way very soon. In the meantime, enjoy your training.